Shalom to all our many, many participants. I am Dina Wachtel, talking to you from Israel and hoping that I won't be interrupted with a red alert uh, siren. Together with my colleague Ayala Davis and on behalf of our organization, Canadian Friends of Hebrew University, I want to welcome you to this one hour long program. We will get right into the subject matter, talking about the current escalation of events in Israel. Ido, please take it away. Thank you, Dina. This is um, uh, also an opportunity to thank you and the entire staff for all the great work that you're doing year round. And these are tough times in, in Israel and Jewish communities worldwide. And uh, uh, what I'd like to do is uh, share um, some, um, some slides with you. And then uh, with your permission, I'd like to really go through the slides and uh, just to put things in perspective, give you the little bit of context. Uh, this is the fourth round of uh, belligerency between Israel and Hamas, which rules the Gaza Strip since 2006. And, um, and, uh, but this one is different, and I'd like to um, um, say a few words about the difference. A few basic assumptions that we have to make in order to understand the context. The first is, there is no military solution. It's very important to understand that there is no military solution. Um, certainly not when Hamas is introduced new military capabilities, in their cases, a uh, wider range of, um, of the missiles uh, with more precision, with more impact. Um, this is something that even the Iron Dome system cannot cope with effectively, although the Iron Dome system probably saved many, many lives. Second basic assumption, uh, if traditionally we thought about the soldiers in the front lines as the main concern of the society, then today home front is the key. Uh, when you have Tel Aviv under attack, when you have, if you remember during the second Lebanon war, we had the Haifa region under attack. When you have those uh, uh, urban centers under severe attack, then home front becomes the key. And uh, we'll talk, of course, today about what is happening in the home front, especially in the binational cities. Um, Israel going into any conflict with the Palestinians is in a built-in disadvantage. It's important to understand a lot of people are frustrated with the way Israel is responding. You have to understand that a lot of it stems from the context, and the context is that Israel has the military might. Israel has the economic strength, and therefore Israel is not being perceived as the side uh, that, that is weak or the side that, that requires or needs sympathy. It's not a question of justice, it's a question of positioning. We'll talk about that as well. Um, the fourth basic assumption, the Palestinians, especially the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, have nothing to lose, have nothing to lose. A lot of it has to do with the Abraham Accord that left them out there in the cold. They felt that they both, the Palestinians in the West Bank, as well as the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, as well as the supporters of the Palestinian National Movement within the State of Israel. Most of them are Arabs, but there's some Jews. Um, they feel that the Abraham Accord basically sidelined the Palestinian cause. Uh, the Palestinian plight has never been weaker. This is, if you want, uh, a cry for help. Um, fifth basic assumption, the United States has bigger fish to fry. Uh, President Biden issued a statement which was, uh, Basically, uh, um, uh, nothing, not, nothing to write home about, something very routine. Um, the, United, the United States has to deal with major issues, uh, COVID-19, the, uh, the economy, uh, social and, and, and racial tensions, and of course, climate change, which the administration uh, self-proclaimed as the main item on their agenda. Um, Another basic assumption, very important to understand Israel for whatever reason, and I'm not judging the reasons of the Israeli leadership, but the Israeli leadership um, went the extra mile to humiliate the Iranians. Uh, this happened the last several years, and Iran is simply waiting for the right opportune moment to launch revenge. And we see their fingerprints and their footprints all over this conflict. We'll talk about that as well. And lastly, the internal strife is deepening and is not going to go away. So these are the basic assumptions. Three things to understand about the context. The first is, uh, when I talk about Israel's built-in disadvantage, it's because of the twinning. What happened is that Israel, for many, many years, 
whenever Israel was given a chance to communicate its country to the world, it spoke about the uh, conflict with the Palestinians, thus creating a twin. In marketing, twinning is when two competing products, ideas, concepts, ideologies are competing for the same uh, uh, slot, for the same position. And uh, by definition, whenever one side is making a move, it forces the other side to make a move. And this is what we're seeing here in the process. Israel, of course, elevated the Palestinians. If you think about it, just the other day, there was a horrible uh, um, attack against the Kurds conducted by the Turks. Um, no one mentioned that in the late night shows, only the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. That's the price that we're paying for the twinning that we ourselves created. It did not start with the current government. It started with way back then uh, in the 1960s, even earlier in the 1950s, um, whenever we had a chance, we talked about the um, our Arab uh, uh, counterparts and thus we created our own twin. The second thing is information overload. Many of you are being exposed to very unpleasant messages on social media. Uh, it's important to understand the main reason why people identify Israel as the side that is on the wrong side of the issue is because of that. People are looking for simple solutions. Israel's advantage is in the deep, historical, detailed um, uh, description of the situation. Um, when, you're, um, when you're looking for simple explanations, uh, Israel is in a built-in disadvantage. And lastly, um, this conflict is a historical conflict because it will, um, uh, and, and that's what makes it different than the previous rounds with Gaza. Um, it will force Israel to change its security paradigm. What do I mean by that? In the old days, um, we were used to believe, or we were led to believe, that the only threat that matters is a tangible threat, and usually it was an external threat. Uh, and today we're learning that intangible threats, um, which are also internal, are no less bothering. And the number one intangible threat is the very legitimacy of the state of Israel is being questioned. It's being questioned by celebrities, it's being questioned by people on the street, and all of you are being exposed to that. Um, Israel's, um, from a strategic point of view, never really um, decided whether it's a victim or a victor. It's a big problem. It's a huge problem. You have a nation uh, in Israel that is thinking and behaving like a victim, but the whole world is looking them at them as the aggressor. If you may, in 1967, up until 1967, Israel was the regional David, the Arab world was the regional Goliath. And in 1967, once Israel became the ruler of another people, the paradigm shifted and Israel became the regional Goliath and the Palestinians became the regional David. And the Israelis are in a severe mental jet lag as a society, not really adjusting and adapting to this new reality. Um, what are the factors at play? On the Israeli side, obviously, the fact that we are in the midst of um, the aftermath of a fourth round of national elections, the mandate to form government was given to Yair Lapid. He has 20 more days, more 20 or so more days to form a coalition. We heard today that Naftali Bennett is uh, having second thoughts about going with, uh, with Lapid, but we're not, we don't know if whether it's final or not. Uh, another factor at play, of course, is Netanyahu's legal battle. Many people in Israel uh, don't trust that Netanyahu's uh, considerations and decisions are not affected by, um, by the fact that he's on trial. And that's a very big debate within Israeli society itself. And of course, the main factor at play is the mainstreaming of Kahana's legacy. The fact that Netanyahu had to play for his base and had to support uh, elements that support May Kahana's legacy, enter the Knesset. Um, they instigate trouble all over the place. Uh, there's uh, hard evidence. The Israeli chief of police just went on television um, um, describing the way they're busing uh, rioters around, uh, instigating trouble all over the place. When you think of cities like Akko and Batyam, uh, those were not organic riots. Those were riots that were instigated by external forces. So these are the factors at play on the Israeli side. On the Palestinian side, the factors at play are, are also similar. They also have a lot to do with the internal situation within the Palestinian Authority. If you, uh, if you probably paid attention to what's happening in the West Bank, 
Mahmoud Abbas just entered the 15th year of his four-year term. He promised elections many, many years ago. It hasn't happened. Um, and he uh, indicated that he's interested in um, um, conducting another round of democratic elections uh, for the uh, Palestinian Authority. Hamas, that felt it had a good chance of winning the elections, was very disappointed to learn of Mahmoud Abbas's decision to cancel the elections. So this has a lot to do with what you're seeing. Of course, the Abraham Accords, we spoke about it. They feel that they're being pushed to the sidelines by, the, by history, if you may. Uh, the Abraham Accord uh, were celebrated all over the world with the exception of the Palestinians. The only ones who did not uh, bless and said this is a wonderful thing were the Palestinians and of course the Iranians. Hamas and Iran have an axis. Iran is also cultivating the axis with Hezbollah. Um, Iran, as I said before, is waiting for the right moment uh, to claim its revenge. And this is also another factor at play on the Palestinian side. Um, on, the, on, the, on the Israeli side, it's important to understand Israel is facing several fronts. In many ways, it's unprecedented. Um, Israel is facing, obviously, the situation in Hamas. Hamas has demonstrated uh, very impressive military capabilities. I dare to say uh, that the Israeli military was surprised by it. Uh, Israel is facing unrest in the West Bank, especially in the eastern part of Jerusalem. Israel is facing the possibility, which is very real. I will not be surprised if we will hear about inflammation along the, the, the northern border with Hezbollah. Again, remember, Iran is behind the scenes pulling the strings. Israel is facing, obviously, the war against Iran hasn't ended. It's still going on day in and day out. Uh, we call it the Cold War, but it's actually a very warm war. Israel is facing the unrest of the Israeli Arabs. We can talk about that during the Q&A session, why the Israeli Arabs are so um, um, uh, disgruntled. And, um, and of course, Israel will have to face its radical right. We've seen things that we've never seen before in Israel, like Jews lynching Arabs, um, very, very tough images and tough things to, to absorb uh, if you're an Israeli, if you're a Zionist, if you care about the future of the state of Israel. What are the risk factors? The, the first risk factor, of course, is that the years and years and years, decades of uh, work to heal the rift between Jews and Arabs and Muslims in the state of Israel uh, will go down the drain. It's, um, uh, it's a very real possibility because, of, again, information overload, uh, people are being exposed to images that otherwise would not have been exposed to. This would have an impact. The danger of widespread anarchy, very much like uh, what happened in the United States when the government uh, doesn't believe, when elected officials do not believe in their civil service, when they're not building them up, when they don't trust them, when they use terms like deep state, um, in the moment of truth, that civil service, including law enforcement, including the military, may not be able to perform at the level that they should. And this is exactly what you're seeing today in Israel, the collapse of the entire system. Uh, police is unable to stop the anarchy. Uh, they're talking about asking the military to intervene in places like Claude and others. Uh, loss of trust and confidence. Uh, again, COVID-19 was a, uh, a very traumatic chapter uh, all over the world of people realizing the systemic deficiencies of their own governments. Add to that the fact that Israelis now are looking at what's happening. Uh, Tel Aviv is under attack, 250 rockets in one night. Uh, Iron Dome system is very limited in what it can do. And Israelis are losing their confidence and their trust, not only in their government, but also, sadly, in the Israel Defense Forces and the Israeli police. And lastly, um, the risk factor on the Palestinian-Israeli political side is very much like Camp David. We're looking at a, a, a very dangerous situation where uh, this could take us back uh, a generation or two in terms of, of the ability to create uh, an effective kind of, of negotiations. Who stands to gain? Hamas definitely positioned itself as a main actor, uh, reinforced its position within the Palestinian Authority. Uh, within, uh, obviously, they show resistance. We have to remind our viewers today that Mahmoud Abbas, whether you like him or not, 
he is the first Palestinian leader to commit himself and the Palestinian Authority to nonviolence. Um, Hamas, of course, does not accept the idea of nonviolence. The second thing that Hamas should be, uh, as far as they're concerned, obviously, we should all be very sad about it, but they should be very happy about it, that they took a step towards turning this conflict into a religious conflict. Um, the conflict that Israel has with the national movement of the Palestinian people is a political conflict by definition and could and should be resolved politically and diplomatically. The conflict that Israel has with groups such as Hamas, Al-Qaeda, Hezbollah, and others is a religious conflict. And with them, there is no compromise. They're not interested in, uh, in, in talking to Israel or compromising with Israel or reaching an agreement with Israel. They're interested in implementing their maximalist view, which is the annihilation of the state of Israel. Uh, Netanyahu himself, as the individual, as the person, stands to gain from this situation. Uh, it helps him to block the attempts of Lapid and Bennett to form a coalition that will replace him. Uh, this is not a done deal yet, but um, uh, it, it is possible that he would be successful doing so. And of course, creating a national sense of urgency and anxiety, which helps him, uh, uh, generally speaking. Iran stands to gain. Um, again, as I said before, this may have been the beginning of the Iranian uh, revenge, um, but also... It's just a continuation, another, another small victory in their attempt to destabilize the region by using proxy forces all over the, the region, from Yemen to Bahrain to Syria, and of course, to the Gaza Strip. Who stands to lose? Um, of course, Mahmoud Abbas and the Palestinian Authority that are um, weakening uh, as, as this conflict continues. The other Abbas, Mansour Abbas, the leader of uh, the Arab Israeli party, Ram, who was willing to negotiate and enter the Lapid Bennett coalition, finds himself in a, in a weakened position. Lapid and Bennett themselves find themselves in a very weak position as a result of this. Lapid may lose the only chance that he had to form a change coalition. Bennett, if he will go to another round of elections, if, uh, if Bennett doesn't join Lapid, to replace Netanyahu, it means that we're more likely in 20 days, we're more likely to see another round of elections. This will be election number five. I don't know if Bennett will um, will will do better in, in in round number five than he did in round number four. Let, let us let me remind our viewers that in round number three he didn't even make it into the Knesset. And Saar, of course, who has seven seats, may also stand to lose from a fifth round of elections. And of course, the biggest victim of what we're seeing of this anarchy, of this unrest, is Arab-Jewish coexistence that was always uh, uh, fragile. Possible scenarios. There are three large scenarios, possible scenarios. The first is that we will see the end of belligerency in, in the coming days. It may take a couple of weeks, but eventually it will subside. It happened before. Um, another possibility is that um, the Hezbollah in the north will join in, will find a reason to join in, and that will create an entirely new situation for the state of Israel. Again, unprecedented Israel will be attacked on both fronts. Again, as I said before, the home front will become the main story. And um, the, the third option, which probably is more likely to be the one uh, that we will see in months to come, is the continuation of the conflict uh, in, in, in a different kind of intensity. It will not completely go away, but we will see every once in a while rockets. We will see every once in a while um, uh, Hamas is targeting. And don't forget that also in the Gaza Strip, we have the Islamic Jihad, which is not necessarily aligned with Hamas. And they usually work independently. 